Good morning, everyone. I am Daniela Maria Ciuillo from the San Rafael Scientific Institute, and I will be the chair of today's seminar. This seminar is the third of the series of three that were brought to, um, to us in collaboration with Beckton and Dickinson and are um, sponsored by the European Society of Microbiology. The Beckton Dickinson as a sponsor had no role in the content of the seminar. You can see on the slide a few housekeeping notes. You can send your question during the talk using the live chat window. Uh, the message goes to everyone, include your affiliation in your question in case we won't have the question will be brought to the speakers after the talk. If, in case we won't have any time to answer to your question, you can still email your questions to the office of the ESM and we will forward the question to the, to the speakers. So the today topics is on sampling, ordering and logistics as the key for good TB diagnostic. This is a very important topic and we will try to move from the clinical to the microbiological part of the, of the, the role of the laboratory. And we do have two excellent speakers today. Dr. Harald Hoffman, that many of you know. Dr. Harald Hoffman is the head of the WHO Supranational TB Reference Laboratory in Munich, Gauting, and uh, is leading one of the largest microbiological diagnostic centers in Europe. Is not only an excellent microbiologist, but is also a researcher and has been working a lot as a consultant for the WHO as well. Clinical view will be shared by Dr. Simon Tiberi. Simon is a consultant physician and honorary clinical reader in infectious diseases at Parts Health Trust and Queen Mary University of London. He is working in three different hospitals and is running the infection and tuberculosis clinic. He's also an expert for the British Thoracic Society Multidrug Resistant Tuberculosis Clinical Advisory Service. He's also the TB Secretary for the European Respiratory Society and Deputy Chair of the Global TB Network Consilium. His research field is mainly on mycobacteria and respiratory infection. And last but not least, I've been working with Simon. Is a, a, Simon was a graduated from the San Raffaele in Milano, my own institute, and we have been working together when he was very young. So uh, with that, I uh, leave the word to Dr. Tiberi that will introduce uh, the clinical view on this topic. Thank you very much uh, for the very kind invitation and, and the very, very warm introduction, Daniela. Um, so, um, hello everyone, and I'm going to be talking to you today mainly around the uh, interface between the clinician and uh, the laboratory, and one of the important things um, in this talk that we're going to be talking today is the diagnostic challenges. So, what are the challenges? How can we diagnose tuberculosis more efficiently and promptly? than what we're already doing? How can we reduce these delays? How can we improve outcomes in our patients? Um, we know that if we are to eliminate TB, uh, we need to be better at detecting uh, tuberculosis, detecting resistance, uh, because there's still a lot to do. And especially now with COVID-19, we've probably been set back by a decade and it's going to be really, really challenging to uh, eliminate TB. So the first thing is, unless you think TB, you will not find TB. And so it's, it's extremely important to always think tuberculosis 
and um, it's it's really important to uh, obviously know the, the four main signs of tuberculosis weight loss fevers uh, cough night sweats and um, obviously the warning signs of hemoptysis all of these different signs should always put a little light bulb in someone's mind to think about tuberculosis and that should hopefully prompt us to consider it and to start our diagnostic um, our diagnostic pathways. So TB can be challenging to diagnose. It's not all pulmonary TB. Um, the patients do not say, I have tuberculosis. Um, TB can affect any organ in the body. There's, there's not uh, one tissue in, in, in the body that is um, spared from tuberculosis. Uh, it's an indolent disease and it can develop over weeks and months. Um, sometimes patients have been going on for months, potentially years, with symptoms and are, uh, are not diagnosed. Symptoms can come and go over time as well. So sometimes patients feel a little bit better and they decide that um, they won't go to see the doctor because they're feeling better. So drenching night sweats, fevers, weight loss are the red flags, cough, hemoptysis, back pain, lymphadenopathy may give away the sight. And next slide. So it's always important, any of that happens, get a chest X-ray and also some sputum, sputum for acid fast bacilli. And it's important that that sputum is of optimal quality, uh, just like here on the right, these are both of optimal quality. Uh, the chest X-ray can give some uh, hints, cavitation, apical changes, uh, miliary findings, calcifications, a prior gone focus, or uh, right-sided hyla uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, especially in children, and that's fairly pathognomonic. Uh, also, unilateral pleural effusion uh, is also um, uh, sometimes a sign of TB. Extra pulmonary TB can be that little bit harder to, to diagnose, and, and that could be because there's, there's a hip um, uh, inflammation, hip pain, and um, sometimes patients can go on for years um, having several diagnostic taps, but if no one sends that sample off for acid fast bacilli, no one thinks about TB, these patients just receive standard antibiotics for to cover Staphylococcus aureus, gram positives or, or gram negatives, but no one thinks TB. Um, what can we do? We can send off some bloods, some blood tests, but they're not particularly specific. Um, we have to remember that an IGRA test is not diagnostic for active TB. We know that 30% or more of cases um, of times it can be negative, even with active disease. A HIV test is should always be requested, and this is this is mandatory. We should always remember to do a HIV test because TB diagnosis could also um, mean that the patient has HIV. And um, TB is one of the main causes of death for people living with HIV. CRP is generally low, it's not always the case. Uh, it is possible for patients to present with super added bacterial infections and sepsis, but um, generally CRP is, is, is very low. Uh, monocytosis may or may not be present and calcium may be raised. Um, we should always consider exposure risks. Did the patient have a history of contact with a TB case? Did a relative have TB? Um, what did the patient have? Um, did the patient reside or was born in a high incidence TB country? Uh, was the patient ever homeless, incarcerated? Is the patient a healthcare worker? So any of those potentially there's a higher risk of TB and therefore you should consider it in your differential diagnosis. But we should always remember that anyone can get and develop TB. It's an infectious disease and it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't need introductions. So it's possible to have delays in healthcare access. It's important to, to realize that some people may interpret their symptoms differently. So um, patients may think that they have sweats due to substance abuse or withdrawal. Uh, patients may be going through the menopause. Uh, they may have heating on in, during the winter. Um, weight loss may be due to, they think, a successful diet or depression. And cough may be due to smoking. Um, some patients may have other priorities. They may need to work, sustain family, so they may not really prioritize their own health and they may delay their presentation. And also healthcare systems may not always be easily accessible. Um, and this is, is not only in uh, low resource settings, but also in, in settings like, for example, here in East London, um, some patients don't have uh, easy access to, to healthcare. Um, they may 
fear um, going into hospital because um, they may not have a clear immigration status and they may um, be uh, cautious and unaware of deportation so they may not present for these reasons. So what diagnostics do we have? Most laboratories at least in, in Europe have uh, access to standard standard TB bacteriology, so the possibility to send off a smear for um, acid phosphobacilli staining, so Zeal Nielsen staining or Oramin staining, my lab um, does both, and then st standard culture, um, mostly with uh, liquid culture, and then um, at least in our setting in the UK, uh, we send our isolates off to the reference laboratory uh, for susceptibility testing and whole genome sequencing. Um, we do some molecular testing in-house using um, the uh, CAFED and BDMAX, um, but the reference lab has access to other tests and there are other manufacturers that offer these, these tests. Um, so pulmonary cases, these are just uh, some images just to show you um, this is a case of a gentleman who had MDR-TB uh, with some very small cavities and, and you can see a little bit of miliary, um, very, very fine millet. Uh, seed-like um, disseminations in both lung fields. And this is, a, an, again, another case of miliary TB. Um, and you can see these, all these little white dots of, of TB. Here you've got um, cavities, uh, and over here you've got uh, bilateral disease. Apologies, I'm, I'm giving a talk. Um, so for, for pulmonary samples, um, remember uh, you have um, uh, to send off three samples, at least three, um, but it is sometimes possible to send two. We, the studies have been done showing that uh, two samples are just as good enough as three. Um, and some, in some centers, it's possible to induce sputum uh, with hypertonic saline um, if, if necessary, or to do bronchoscopy and a lavage. Um, it, it's also possible to do uh, bronchoscopy with EBUS to obtain histo histology. And um, the standard should always be getting samples for microscopy and for culture. And additional tests could include uh, nucleic acid amplification tests, for example, with the CAFED, Abbott, or BDMAX. Um, and obviously, in imaging terms, we can do chest x ray, CT scans. Um, Pleural cases, some patients sometimes present just with a, a pleural effusion. Here you can see there's a right-sided pleural effusion, which will require a tap. And that tap um, would require um, both looking for cells, so it may be lymphocytic rich. If it is lymphocytic rich, consider uh, sending off the TB culture. The yield for TB PCR generally is very low. Um, it's generally better to get a good yield from doing a bronchoscopy in a patient with pleural fluid, uh, pleural effusion. And uh, also culture is more sensitive um, on a bronchoscopy rather than on the uh, pleural fluid in say. Um, doing a pleural uh, biopsy also has a good yield and has a better PCR yield. Um, it's also possible to consider putting pleural fluid if it's lymphocyte rich into quantifron tubes. And uh, there are several studies that support this. Uh, and it's also possible to send the pleural fluid off for adenosine deaminase as well, which may include the diagnosis, but it might not be able to exclude it necessarily. A CNS TB case. So I'm going to briefly talk to you about a, a gentleman that I treated uh, last year, um, about a year and a half ago. Um, this is a 30 year old um, banker who. Uh, um, was generally fit and well. He presented with some fevers, headaches, and weight loss. Uh, on admission, he was quite disoriented. Uh, he forgot how to speak in English and only spoke in uh, Urdu. And um, he had no focal signs or neurological deficits. CT scan of his head was, was normal. His chest x-ray showed an old calcification, but there was nothing active or florid uh, on, on the chest x-ray. We did some blood tests. He had a HIV test, which was negative. He was started on standard keftraxone and acyclovir uh, in consideration of a potential uh, community-acquired meningitis of bacterial or viral um, origin. Um, we did an MRI scan, which showed uh, nothing initially. Uh, and um, on, on further reviews with the, with the neuroradiologists, it was felt that there was an abnormal bone marrow signal in the clevis, which is this bone which sits at the base of, of, of the skull. 
and uh, another neuroradiologist felt that um, this was a vasculitis and unlikely to be TB. Um, subsequently, other reviews said that this could potentially be a basal meningitis. In any case, um, we felt that this could be TB uh, based on his prior residence in a TB endemic region and the fact that he had a calcified lesion in his lung. Hence, we started TB medications on the second day of his admission. Um, we sent off uh, some uh, CSF, we did a lumbar puncture, which sowed 18 white cells, um, moderately, uh, fairly reduced glucose, and a raised protein. Uh, the TB-PCR was negative. 2 ml of CSF was sent, maybe was not enough. Uh, most centers request three or more mLs of CSF and, and some colleagues in Vietnam now are mandating more than six mLs of CSF should be sent off for, um, for TB-PCR. And obviously that's a lot of drops of uh, CSF. That's 120 drops of, of uh, liquor. Um, it was culture positive. So even though the TB-PCR was negative, it did not exclude the, the infection. We did culture mycobacterium tuberculosis and that was fully susceptible. 35 days later. We also did a sphenoid biopsy and we, we did a biopsy of the cleaval bone, but that came back negative and didn't show any granulomas. So he had uh, TB treatment. Uh, his clinical course was complicated by a paradoxical reaction. Um, he developed communicating hydrocephalus and required placement of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And he improved and he was discharged after 10 weeks in hospital. And he's now had a complete resolution of symptoms after 12 months of treatment. And he remains disease free and he's happy man. Uh, these are a few more slides to show just what we can sometimes see in CNS TV. Here we can see a number of different tuberculomas. Uh, and this was a HIV positive gentleman with uh, CNS TB. So for CNS TB, it can be very difficult to, uh, to get a diagnosis. Um, we require imaging. Imaging can show basal meningitis, but it's very important to get that liquor, the CSF. It's important to get CSF for culture. Culture is probably the most sensitive um, test. It is possible to send CSF for ADA. Um, and it's also possible to send for TB-PCR. For TB-PCR, um, potentially you get better yields if you get larger volumes of CSF, more than six mLs, and it helps to centrifuge and to be, uh, beat with beats um, to get a better yield uh, and a more sensitive test. So sensitivity of current diagnostics, um, currently the most sensitive uh, diagnostic method is liquid culture and hence the reason why it's so important to get samples. Uh, these are some lymphadenopathy cases. So uh, these patients have a very wide differential. Um, a gentleman coming in with a uh, enlarged lymph node of, of the neck uh, could be lymphoma, it could be cancer, it could be uh, a bacterial infection, uh, but obviously it could also be tuberculosis, hence the need to lance the, the node, get pus samples, send for culture, potentially send for TB-PCR if there's a, a query of resistance, uh, and also to get a, a faster diagnosis. This is a CT PET scan showing different lymph nodes. It's also possible to do uh, biopsies of uh, lymph nodes through either EBUS via bronchoscopy or via interventional radiology CT guided biopsies. So for lymph nodes, um, generally we, we get samples for uh, histopathology to exclude cancer, which is always important, and, and lymphoma. It's also important to send off for culture, uh, standard culture for microbiology, but also culture for acid fast bacilli. It's also important to exclude other infections and diseases. Um, this is a uh, chest x-ray of a gentleman, a 49-year-old man who had pericardial effusion. Here you can see a kind of flask-shaped uh, heart and um, fluid was uh, taken by a pericardial tap and that was sent off for TB-PCR. And in this case, we were lucky we made a diagnosis from the TB-PCR. Uh, the patient received TB treatment and improved. 
Um, here it's possible, again, cultures required, um, samples are sent off a culture, histopathology, cytology, but also viral markers, uh, because uh, in the differential, mainly of pericardial um, effusions, there's a lot of um, viral uh, etiologies to exclude. And um, again, Millery TB, uh, this was a 53-year-old uh, patient um, who uh, attended, uh, was found to be an eight presenter, he was positive on the HOV test uh, on admission. And uh, we made a diagnosis of TB thanks to uh, doing blood cultures for acid phosphobacilli. And TB grew after six days on the uh, blood cultures. So um, if you see this picture, um, send uh, a HIV test off uh, and also consider sending off blood cultures for TB and starting TB treatment immediately. And uh, so to conclude, TB is not disappearing anytime soon, unfortunately. We will continue to manage TB cases in Europe in the near future. Um, it is becoming more challenging as more of these cases are becoming extra primary. Currently in the UK, 60% of all our TB confirmed cases are extra primary um, and only 40% are primary now. Um, and, and therefore that, that becomes much, much harder for us to make these, these diagnoses. Uh, we find ourselves with several tests that often require certain interpretation and also follow-up. And we do need biomarkers for diagnosis, um, for more rapid diagnosis, and, and also for following up patients on treatment. We also need a test of cure. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'm very happy to take any questions at the end of uh, Dr. Hoffman's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And now, Harald, the floor is yours for the microbiological point of view. And we will take the question at the end of Harald's talk. Um, Harold, you're muted. I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I was muted. <laughs> but now, now it works. So thank you very much, Graniela, for, for the introduction and, um, and uh, the, the very nice um, sharing as well. It's, um, it's not like uh, the, the pure um, microbiological point of view. I'm, I was supposed to talk more about um, IT solutions around TB diagnostics in, in countries where IT solutions are not yet um, well established everywhere. Um, so it's, it's dealing with ordering and logistics, which uh, are also keys of good TB diagnostics, but um, rarely thought about. Uh, and now the mind changes more and more, and we see that e-health solutions are, of, um, are introduced everywhere in the world, not, not only in the well-industrialized countries, but also in high prevalence countries where um, the solutions might not yet be so, so common. The ideal world, I also need to familiarize with the pointer here. Ah, the ideal world would be that uh, a doctor is sitting down with a patient, um, then he thinks we need to, to get some lab um, analysis done. He orders the, the lab analysis while he's still talking with the patient um, in the computer. There is an electronic uh, order form which he can use. Then he asks the nurse to, to draw the samples or collect the samples, label the samples with the barcode, which is immediately printed out when he orders the, the lab orders. Then there's a um, transportation system established, which allows to transport the samples directly to the lab on the same day. In the lab, the samples are immediately processed. Um, the, the order is already there online, um, and the local laboratory knows exactly what to do. And uh, does the analyzer on the same day, 
enters the results in the computer and the doctor can read it right away and show it to the uh, patient and discuss it with the patient um, on his uh, mobile device or even in the computer. Sounds a lot like um, science fiction, particularly when we're talking about same day diagnostics, but this is exactly what is nowadays standard in, in many, many countries and also here in, in our lab um, with most of our submitters. A bit more close to reality in many other countries is that um, the doctor is talking to the patient, uh, samples are collected, then um, a handwritten lab order is, um, is issued, then the, the, the um, samples are stored on site until the transportation system comes and brings the samples to the lab, where the samples are manually registered then um, they're given to the workplace, the analysis is done, the results are written um, by hand in, in forms and handbooks. From there, they are copied on report forms. Um, the doctor validates the, um, the result. And then finally, um, uh, the, the, re the report to the doctor is issued, handed over to another transportation service and then brought to the doctor. This can take five days easily, but we also observed um, in, in some, some of our WHO review missions um, that it can take up to three weeks for TB-PCR to be um, performed and the result being reported back to the doctor. And this is certainly not what we, we expect from a PCR, which takes 90 minutes um, itself. That's why we need to have solutions around, um, which helps to speed up the system and to speed up the the services. This becomes particularly challenging since we are dealing in TB with a multi-layer um, diagnostic network with local laboratories which perform maybe microscopy or gene expert, then medium uh, microscopy, uh, medium laboratories which might perform um, uh, PCR, um, line probe assays and culture. And then the highly equipped um, modern and, and industrial um, uh, level three laboratories, reference laboratories, which perform DST culture um, and may maybe even the whole genome sequencing, which uh, Simon just mentioned as one of the um, important new diagnostic tools. All these uh, different layers of, of laboratories, they need to communicate with, with each other. And um, there need to be transportation of samples from one uh, lab to another. And this requires modern and highly efficient solutions. The USAID EDICA project in Central Asia, which is uh, um, called EDICA because the, one of the goals is to eliminate tuberculosis in Central Asia, which will probably not be successful, um, totally successful at the end. But um, I think um, the idea um, is, is clear. There, there will be very good and smart modern solutions implemented to help the countries to eliminate the uh, tuberculosis in near future. And one of those solutions shall be among others in the laboratory, and that's the part we are responsible for, um, the planning of BSL-3 laboratories uh, where there is a lack of such facilities and, and also the commissioning of those, capacity building, the implementation of NGS and other modern WHO endorsed diagnostic tests, also like BDMAX, which uh, Simon has mentioned, the quality management um, and uh, system implementation and the guidance of labs towards um, ISO 1589 accreditation. And then the components which I will present now, the, the implementation of laboratory information management systems in TB laboratories um, of three countries, uh, at least in pilot regions, as well as the um, implementation of sustainable logistics and laboratory transportation systems. Let's start with the lab information systems. Um, this is Nadia, who is our um, IT um, expert and, and laboratory information experts, um, who helps us with the um, um, tendering and also the implementation of the systems, not us, I mean the countries within the USAID Etica project. Now, before we talk about um, the details, let's first agree upon a common um, definition. And like always, Wikipedia has probably the best definition out there. And I just want to read it down. Um, a laboratory information management system is considered a software-based solution with features that support a modern laboratory's operations. 
Key features include, but are not limited to, workflow and data tracking support, flexible architecture and data exchange interfaces, which fully support its use in regulated environments, such like diagnostic laboratories. The features and uses of a LIMS have evolved over the, uh, the years from simple sample tracking to an enterprise resource planning tool that manage multiple aspects of laboratory informatics. Well, this means that uh, the, the laboratory information system we are looking for is of course the has the core functionality to store the data that the lab produces, including the patient data, the analyze, uh, analytic data, and the, the submitter data. But it also has the, the response or the task to include or at least um, support all these uh, features that are um, displayed here. We want to have a sample management um, component, a quality assurance component. Reporting shall be facilitated either electronically or at least um, by, by producing um, well-structured reports. The documentation is required of all our analyzers, the quality controls, etc. We need to get connected with all the instruments and uh, equipment, and this should be a bi-directional um, connection, which means that data are sent to the equipment, and the equipment knows exactly which analysis is required, and then the results are sent automatically back by the um, by the uh, equipment back to the laboratory information system, and then for the process there. We need to have an inventory management um, so that uh, the procurement is facilitated by the laboratory information system, um, since we know what we have on stock, what is um, what is uh, expiring soon, and then we can um, order according to our needs. Then uh, lab execution system, quotation and invoicing, that's not so important for, for many countries where um, uh, um, TB diagnostics is anyway for free. Sample tracking is quite important since um, many samples are lost over, over the time. Just a brief um, anecdote. We had a, a friend of mine who is a lab manager here or used to be a lab manager here in, in Munich. He was in Japan. In Japan, we have the largest labs in the world. And he, he told them that, so oh, we have a couple of um, maybe 1,200 samples per day, not TB in general, uh, clinical chemistry. And then the Japanese colleague laughed and said, oh, that's exactly the number of samples which are lost in our lab per week. So just to see there are many samples lost over the time. And, um, and we need to, to have a tracking system in order to, to look for those uh, lost samples. We need to have electronic uh, notebooks in, um, which, needs, uh, which uh, helps us uh, manage data, the stability studies, workflow management. Workflow management is key because uh, a good laboratory information system helps you to facilitate processes in the lab to speed them up, to control that uh, no, uh, no sample and no analysis and no work step is forgotten. But furthermore, the laboratory information system needs to integrate with all the other management systems of, of a modern lab. There's the quality management system, which is also part of the USAID EDICA project. There's the environmental management system, um, including the energy management, uh, but also waste management, um, et cetera. The work safety and biosafety management system, the resource management system, including um, stock uh, warehouse and stock keeping, um, ordering and procurement, the compliance management system, preventing um, uh, bribery and, and other things, um, and finally, of, and, and data safety, of course, and finally, then the laboratory information system, which is one of the key components of, of all these integrated management systems. Now, when you want to see how the laboratory information system can help you in your further in your daily diagnostics, we need to agree upon the diagnostic cycle cycle in the lab. And everything starts with the doctor-patient interaction, as uh, as Simon um, described it in the beginning. If the patient sitting there, the doctor thinks about um, uh, some lab analysis required, he fills in an order sheet. The order sheet um, is then uh, given to the nurse, the nurse connects the data, uh, the, the samples, the samples are labeled, given or handed over to a transportation system, whichever it is, could be a nurse, could be a doctor, could be the patient itself, um, like in many countries. 
the samples are transported to, to the lab, registered there, um, then handed over to the respective workplace where the work is done, which needs to be done. The sample is analyzed, the results are recorded, they are validated, they are transferred to a report form, and then hand, uh, transported and handed over to the doctor. The doctor sees the results and thinks, oh, it could be this differential diagnostic. And in order to substantiate this uh, diagnosis, I need to have further analysis. And then he orders um, the next uh, series of diagnostic uh, tests. They are sent uh, again to the lab and the cycle starts again. That's everyday clinical life, as we agree. And these are the different work steps we need to consider. And at least two of those are purely logistical work steps which should be um, dealt with uh, uh, separately in the next uh, part of this talk. All these work steps need to be facilitated um, by the laboratory information system, including logistics, um, since we, we can also um, make this more sustainable and reliable. Just some examples how, the, how my talk can crash. I am so sorry. But uh, somehow, somehow the presentation has crashed. So let me start. Let me start it again, wherever it is. Harald, don't worry. Just to restart your presentation. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's the challenge we have with Apple every once in a while. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let's we we have been and share the screen again. Here we go. Share. And the presentation. presentation mode. Perfect. Do you see it again? I think, yeah, that's where yeah. we've been. But, uh, you. you need to go on uh, presenting mode. You, We now see the double screen. So you need oh. to switch. Now it's dark, is it? No, it's better now? Me. Yeah, that's perfect now. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So just some examples how the electronic data uh, uh, um, laboratory information system can improve diagnostics. Um, we have now the current situation, the doctor is filling in the form. Um, by filling in the form, we ex frequently experience incomplete patient data, incomplete orders or unreadable orders. We can also um, face incorrect or lacking or um, promiscuous or unreadable um, labeling of the samples. And this leads then to false or incomplete diagnostics. Then the doctor is frustrated, the patient is frustrated, and this leads to loss of, of uh, trust in laboratory, uh, laboratory diagnostics. And, um, and then at the end, um, bad patient management, because only when, when everybody is trusting in all the systems, then the patient is managed in, in a really good way. The solutions electronic laboratory information system can, can offer is that data um, from the patients are imported directly from the hospital information system or the clinical information system. So wherever the patient is el electronically um, labeled, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, registered, we can import the data or at least from any ki kind of card like a security um, card or um, health insurance card or whatever. The submitter can be guided through the ordering process so that we receive all information in the lab that we need and the doctor can, uh, does not forget any important um, order that he requires. We can even offer orders. For example, when he says, um, we have here a, 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 a pleural puncture, we have a cerebral spinal fluid and we, I want to have microscopy and um, culture for TB, we can immediately let a window pop up and say, this is um, an invasively uh, collected sample, and we highly recommend to also um, order um, PCR because um, we should increase the uh, sensitivity of our uh, diagnostics as much as possible. Then the 
system immediately provides the submitter with a barcode label and this then um, is unique and you can always identify the, the sample and, um, and um, assign it to the right order. So there's no confusion possible anymore. When we have uh, the analytic phase, the results are copied on paper from the paper in the lab book, from the lab book in the report. There's a lot of copying error possible, um, which can lead to implausible validation and then to false result. And here, the electronic system directly pulls or imports the results from the equipment, from the gene expert machine or whatever it is, from the MJIT machine, sends it to the laboratory information system. There is no copy process at all. And then it's electronically validated, electronically sent to the doctor. And um, like this, we prevent all the errors which come from handwriting. There is another strong um, risk of delays when, when you have the um, handwritten reports, because the, the trans they need to be transported to the doctor. And uh, this can cause huge delays. That's why um, the electronic system um, sends the, the results electronically on the screen of the doctor, and this uh, is real time. As soon as they are validated, the doctor sees the result. In Central Asia, we are now planning to um, integrate the laboratory information system with the existing um, uh, e-health system, which are mainly um, established in uh, hospitals and the um, uh, polyclinics but also the surveying system, which is available in Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan. The laboratory information system receives the, will receive the order through interfaces from the hospital. Um, then the, uh, the results are directly entered into the laboratory information system, um, either through middleware or um, directly by the analyzing, uh, analyzing um, technician. Um, they are validated in the laboratory information system um, and this allows then at the end of the day to, to um, produce very reliable statistics, which can be used um, for surveillance, but also for quality control, et cetera. We report to the um, hospital either with a printed um, um, report or electronically. Um, when we receive the um, orders electronically, we can send um, the, the results back on the same way. And of course, I'm sorry, um, and of course, everything is also reported to the surveying system so that uh, every information is available at the um, an NTP level in order to, to have a good um, overview of the current situation. What is the current status? We have uh, now, we are still in the tendering process. I have hoped that I can already present the final solution, but um, since we are still in the tendering process due to some delays, I, I'm not allowed to, to send, uh, tell you details. All I can tell you is the process uh, of the tendering, which started with the market research. Then uh, we developed a long list of specifications and tender documents. We developed this tender strategy and the scoring system, which uh, allows us to finally evaluate the, the bids. We called many companies for bids um, and, and also uh, made the... Um, we also made the... Uh, uh, tender public. We shortlisted those um, products which were most promising so far, um, developed a questionnaire um, on the sustainability of the, of the vendors. Um, and then the final decision will come in two weeks when we get back the questionnaires and then the procurement will start. This is just um, a short extract from the um, 159 specifications that we developed on each item that we want to see in a um, good and functional laboratory information system. The red ones are the obligatory specs that we expect this is what you need to have when you want to have a functional um, electronic limbs. But all the others are useful add-ons um, which help to, to um, integrate all the other um, systems that I presented in the beginning. And um, we scored those. Um, uh, and this allowed us finally to come up with a quality score for each of the um, um, submitted bids. Then we asked for the prices and also for the licensing strategy that the company prefers. Um, uh, we for this, in order to, to get a good um, price statement, we 
describe the scenario that we are facing in, in the countries where this, this should be implemented. For example, here um, in this country, we have uh, um, six labs which shall be um, connected to it. Those are mainly the culture and DST laboratories of the country, plus an external administrator. Um, this uh, comes up, or this will be in, in, in total 21 concurrent users, which means in every lab we expect um, up to um, five uh, different people working in the laboratory information system at the same time. Seven lab machines shall be um, connected to it, and to, um, five interfaces to other e health systems will be required. We have uh, so far received more than 10 bids. All systems fulfilled the obligatory specifications. Um, probably those companies which did not um, reply, they either did not fulfill the obligatory specifications or they are not present in the Central Asian region. The difference in the quality um, of the systems was less pronounced than the difference in prices. The prices varied from less than 200,000 US dollars to more than a million US dollars. Um, for this uh, scenario that I just described before. And the implementation plans varied from three to nine months. Funnily, not the most expensive system was the one which was uh, implemented in the shortest period of time. Um, but it's, it's very interesting how differently the companies see the, the um, time required to implement the systems. And all the companies prefer the concurrent user licensing, uh, licensing technology, which means um, that you pay for every user which is using the system at the same time. When you have three users using it at the same time, it uh, costs less than when you have five users um, at the same time being um, connected to the system and using it. Now, the laboratory information system has many advantages, but it will still not speed up the complete system when you don't have a good um, and reliable um, logistics and transportation system. That's why this is the second component I, will, I want to briefly introduce here. Monica Vogel is responsible for it. She is our um, logistics um, consultant in, the, in our institute. Just an example from Nepal. We, here you see all the different um, gene expert centers uh, in the country. And you see that the blue areas, which are the mountain areas in Nepal, every, every area which is in, in, the, in mean uh, higher than 5,000 meters is considered um, mountain areas. And the green area, that's uh, every area between 1,500 and 5,000 meters, that's uh, considered hilly area in, in the Nepalese uh, consideration. So in the hilly area, um, we have some machines, but most of the uh, machines are in the in the um, valley of in the Terai, which is the flat area, which is only 1,500 meters of altitude um, uh, highest. There, most of the machines are, but the population is also the densest down there. But this means that there's a lot of transportation required from many of the districts um, in order to to bring the samples to the um, to the labs where the machines are. So far, this is all done by the patients. The patients will sit with their sputum sample or um, still with the sputum in their lung in a push taxi or in the bus, trafficking to the next uh, lab during this uh, transportation time. Um, he or she will infect all the others in the bus and then uh, he or she reaches the lab, um, provides the sputum and the sputum is analyzed, but the patient might already be back home when the result is produced. And nobody really knows how the result will come back to the patient. So many results are lost and um, that's creating a lot of frustration. There's so many areas with a huge population where, where no gene expert um, um, is available in, in, in near areas so that uh, a lot of trafficking is, um, is needed. And you can imagine that in the hilly area up to 5,000 meters, it's not easy to traffic, uh, to travel at all. But even if you have established a very dense network of gene expert machines, you still need to transport samples for culture and you cannot install a culture laboratory everywhere. We know that our mantra of, um, of good logistics, which we are repeatedly um, um, promoting over quite a, a long time now, is not fully in line with those who, who say 
what, when you buy a lot of gene expert machines, you don't need to bother with logistics anymore. We think there is no laboratory network without a functional um, logistics system, and there is no good um, uh, TB diagnostics without a good TB laboratory network. That's why USAID Etica had this uh, logistics component, and it started with the um, establishment of an, a map of all the um, health facilities in Central Asia which um, produce or which need TB diagnostics. We looked for a software solution and decided for ArcGIS, that's an international geoplanning um, software tool, which allows you to simply enter the geographic coordinates of the healthcare um, facility, and then it will, be, uh, will identify those in the maps. G ArcGIS has maps of all countries in the world um, up down to the smallest streets. It will show you every, every detail of the country. And then um, it will allow you to, to, to define among all these different locations, the stops that you want to combine in a, in a, in a route. It also provo uh, pro proposes different combinations. Then it cal calculates optimal route, um, which requires the lowest time of transportation. But you can also adjust it according to shorter distances, special roads, um, or hurdles, etc. So this allows you to, sorry, to to calculate the exact um, transportation time it will give for every um, health in, um, institution. I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button here. Um, if, it will give you the exact time of arrival when the transport uh, transport will arrive in this health um, um, institute, but also the departure time. And then um, you know exactly when the sample will come back to the lab, when you, for example, start here and then travel all around here and come back here in the evening, you will know this is the time when the samples will arrive and then the, the lab can plan accordingly. Well, just to... To finalize um, and conclude from, from this talk, the, we consider limbs and logistics really crucial for a reliable and rapid clinical di um, laboratory diagnostic cycle. And um, the, the integral components are, um, they, they are both integral components of TB laboratory network management and workflow optimization. When you have a good uh, limbs and a good logistics system, this will tremendously increase the satisfaction of uh, clinical submitting and other submitting partners, um, and also the, the trust in your diagnostics. And this will finally lead to, to a substantially better um, patient management. The laboratory information system um, is helpful for the correctness of data, um, the workflow management within the lab, the interaction with all integrated laboratory management components, and um, allows for electronic order entry and reporting so that uh, the doctor gets the, the full results that he requires within the, the shortest period of time possible. Logistics um, is required to make a lab network to a real network. There is no laboratory network without a good logistics system. There are good software tools out there, and we think that ArcGIS is one of the best um, supporting the planning, supervision, and management um, of, of um, logistics in countries. Um, and that's why we have chosen this uh, for, for our project in, in Central Asia, together with the partners, um, APT and PATH, um, um, in the framework of the USAID Etica project. With this, I thank you for your interest. And I was also supposed to, um, to once again um, ask you to send your questions, uh, which cannot be solved now during the discussion, um, to the um, European Society of Microbacteriology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harald. I, uh, I would like to thank you. And uh, could you please leave the last slide? Thanks. Oh, sorry. And uh, you and Simon for your brilliant talk, and you have addressed the several challenges that we see in the, in the routine, both in our country as well as visiting and supporting or providing technical assistance in high endemic settings. 
Uh, I like uh, to point to everybody that is connected now that the ESM will have the virtual meeting on the 28th and 29th of June. And it's going to be a very interesting meeting. We do have excellent speakers, several posters that will be presented in oral presentation. A lot of topics will be touched and uh, I can guarantee that is going to be um, an interesting meeting for the update that will be discussed uh, during, uh, during the meeting time. In addition, we will have a new series of webinars in the fall addressing tuberculosis infection. But let's move to the questions to our speaker. We do have a question from Mona Lisa Mohanty from India. And the question is, should we always go for biomarkers test for the diagnosis of TB? or it will be taken only as an adjunctive test along with molecular tests. Probably there was a little bit of misunderstanding during um, Simon's presentation on the role of biomarkers. And Simon, would you like to address that according to the WHO recommendation? Yes, absolutely. So we should we should always predilect um, getting samples for for culture uh, and uh, also molecular testing rather than biomarkers. So um, biomarkers are for the future pipeline. So these are, these are diagnostics that will be required for follow up for test of cure. There are several different uh, tests that have been currently. Um, evaluated, um, but currently there's nothing that's been uh, validated or, or recommended at the moment. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and we do have a second question on biomarkers. By using of peptide biomarkers, it is possible to detect specific peptide for TB from blood samples. Again, Simon and Harald, if you would like to add something, there are several uh, products that are under evaluation and no one really knows. Definitely the biomarkers are needed. We desperately need biomarkers for diagnosis, for treatment monitoring, for assessing the duration of the therapy, but I leave the floor to you. So just quickly, um, there are a few uh, tests that are coming out um, looking at um, quantitative PCR on um, CD34 stem cells. So a very recent publication on Lancet Microbe by uh, Professor Martinu and colleagues. So um, it, it is potentially possible to detect uh, TB in, in CD34 cells, whether or not this would be useful um, in treatment follow-up. And, and as, a, as a test of cure, we don't know yet, but uh, it, it's definitely an intriguing tool that could be used for latent TB. Um, and another quantitative test for PCR is the MBLA, which is um, for, for sputum mainly, and it's been used in some clinical trials, for example, Remox, and a few stud trials done by the Panacea group, um, looking at uh, quantitative PCR on, on, on sputum um, and tracking over time responses. So um, there are some new technologies out there. Just exactly how they fit in, we don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, I'll, would you like to add something or to redefine a little bit the field? Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, the quantitative PCR is, is quite promising, and um, but the clinical data are missing. We have very small studies. We have this um, BMRU test, which has been now um, launched, I guess, or will be launched very soon. Um, but the, the clinical data are completely um, uh, missing or very, very uh, little. We have unfortunately not yet the, the one fits all blood test, which tells you this is uh, TB or not TB. We had, um, we had many tests out there which uh, dealt with the antibodies and they should not be recommended at all. They're, this was one of the, the very few 
don't use recommendations of WHO. So do not use the rapid test for TB diagnostics. And I think this is important to mention once again, they are not useful. Um, they are only useful for the companies which sell it, but uh, not for the doctor who wants to, to diagnose TB. Um, they are very poor in sensitivity. They have a lot of false positive results. Um, and that's why you cannot either rule out TB with the test, nor can you um, diagnose it. Um, and then there, there's, there are these um, RNA uh, patterns, um, which are um, um, uh, well produced. Uh, the human RNA patterns, uh, this was a New England Journal paper a couple of years ago. And I know there are several companies now um, working on the development of um, assays, which can be used to not only, it's similar to the IGRA, so it's, it's a similar approach. You take the, uh, the um, antigens of, of the uh, TB bacteria, you stimulate the blood, and then you look for the, um, for the footprint or um, a, a, a pattern of um, RNA, markers produced and, um, and that you can quantify and identify it by qPCR, RT, Q, uh, qPCR. That's definitely the most promising thing we currently have. We have a blood test which can um, not only identify latent TB, but also differentiate between latent and um, active TB. There's one test uh, developed here in, in Munich, even by the um, Tropical um, Institute of Health. This is a flow cell. Um, um, tests, so they are also stimulating blood, then they, they have um, a flow cell and different uh, an intracellular staining procedure for IL-4, IL-12, I think IL-2 and um, interferon gamma. And then with this, they can differentiate somehow between active and latent TB, but it's not um, yet uh, reaching a really commercial phase. Um, as far as I know, it's um, it's uh, uh, developed together with uh, background culture. So that's uh, the, the situation I know of, uh, but Daniela, you, you're much better informed, uh, so you will... You know, in, in reality, there are um, companies are working on this field partially to um, identify moving in the field of incipient tuberculosis, really to pick up an early signature of patients developing the act, moving towards the pathway of no return. And those are based on the scientific uh, um, results. And so we do have signatures with several genes uh, and uh, a couple of companies, they are close to a prototype based on different signatures. We do not know how those really would work when moving out from the research environment and going to real uh, diagnostic settings. Those are promising. They need to be evaluated. A few of them will be released in 20, end of 2021, 2022. There are some proteomic essays that also are under development. There is a Gerald Valls, uh, it's almost a lateral flow essay that could be used uh, to, to do that. What will be there? There is a Biomer Europe microfilm array that is quite complex, that is under evaluation for, again, the signature of active TB, the signature of a recurrence. Uh, uh, we, we really need to look uh, and see more results. At the end, uh, this is needed. What has been recommended by the WHO, if you want to say, as an early, very, uh, prone to the peripheral use of biomarker is the use of PCR, but it's a CRP, protein C-reactive assay, as a um, uh, point of care screening, uh, very, if you want, more sensitive than specific, probably very little specificity, but could be used, and this uh, has been recommended uh, to um, uh, really uh, encourage the people that are positive to proceed into a more, a deeper diagnostic pathway for tuberculosis. Um, 
guidelines for screening has been developed and published by the WHO. I guess you all know now there is an uh, app base uh, uh, that you can download for iPhone and, uh, and smartphone with all uh, the documents from WHO is a very handy tool and uh, I really recommend all of you to look into that. And with that, I really like to thank uh, our um, today's speaker, Simon and Harald. It was very, very interesting. All the people in the audience, the webinar goes on YouTube, so you, uh, you can recommend, you can go back. The part that Harald has presented regarding the tender and the criteria is key for many country because tender specification a, a real key point in trying to achieve what is needed. If you make a mistake in the tender process, then you pay the consequences for years because you don't get what you need. But with that, I really like to thank all of you. I hope to see you during the ESM web meeting and to see you in person in Albania next year. We will meet back sometime. And with that, a good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.